Hello everyone and welcome to today's lecture. Today's lecture is the economics revision lecture. Um, I hope that you are all doing well and that you are ready for um, a little bit of learning in terms of revising a few concepts from economics and prepping for um, your HSC that is uh, fast approaching. So I guess before we get started, I've just put up a few slides about ATAR notes who are providing these lectures. So ATAR notes um, essentially provide a, a range of different high school resources to allow students to achieve success. Now I'll run through a couple of these. So we've got our free resources, which include our study notes, which um, hundreds we've got hundreds of downloadable study notes. We've also got lectures, which you found one, and I'm sure that um, you know, if you haven't already, I guess um, I would recommend to register for all of the subjects that you are doing. So we've got plenty of lectures for a range of different subjects. So we'll definitely check that out if you haven't already. Um, we've also got discussions, so online Q and A's, um, videos with engaging online revision to break away from just continuously, I guess, looking through your textbook or your notes is something a little bit different for your brain to register. I know at this point it can be a little bit um, I guess annoying to just have to constantly read your notes as you're fast approaching all of your exams. Um, newsletters to stay in the loop. ATAR calculator to see if you're on track, what you sort of want to be around in terms of marks. Articles, so with study strategies and study tips to help you achieve success and heaps more. So if you are interested in any of these resources, uh, which are completely free, I would highly recommend going to this link here, so atonotes.com forward slash register. In terms of more resources, these are our paid resources, so TuteSmart, uh, online tutoring from elite recent year 12 grads, so, um, you know, we've got basically everything's recorded, so don't feel like if you're joining at this stage you're missing out, you've got all of it's recorded and all of it is um, up for you to access and you've got loads of different resources as well. Um, study guides with a lot of printed revision materials to, with top tips to help you get the best marks that you can. Um, so those are our colourful books I'm sure you've seen. They're quite thin compared to the textbooks which are really thick and sometimes can overwhelm students. So especially at this stage when you're revising content, this can be a really great tool. And we've also got the online version. So like basically hundreds of the top study guides all in one place on Ed Unlimited. So if you're interested in any of these resources, please do have a look again at the link over here. I've linked it there. Again, feel free to access that and register. Okay, moving on to today's lecture. So today's lecture is the economics revision lecture presented by me. My name is Uzma and I will be taking the lecture today. So we'll go through a couple of things today. We're going to go through the current economic news and HSC economics. Uh, topic one, we're looking at the global economy revision and exam tips, tricks and skills. So first of all, overview of the topics. Uh, the first topic is the global economy, which explores globalization and the impacts of increased global integration on individual economies and on the global economy as well at large, it explores the causes and effects of globalization being both positive and negative. So quite an important um, area to start off with in terms of understanding in integration of individual economies into a global economy. And then what does globalization actually help achieve? What does it consist of? We've then got Australia's place in the global economy, where we look at examining Australia's involvement um, with the global economy. Where does Australia fit in? What do we produce? What what comparative advantages do we have? Uh, we look at different things with that, and I'm sure, obviously, this is all revision for you. Um, the effects of changes of, in the global economy on Australia and tools to measure this relationship as well. We then have our economic issues um, that face the economy, including their causes and their consequences. So this topic also requires trend analysis of these issues in the contemporary Australian economy. So our economic issues are like unemployment, inflation, um, etc. So external stability, all of those. So um, these issues are really important to be able to understand where are they coming from, what are the root causes of them, and then what are the effects of them, consequences. Obviously it can have both negative and positive consequences, but it's just up to 
um, you know, whatever the, the issue is. It's really looking at where it's sitting. Finally, um, economic policies and their management, so functions of all of economic policies in the Australian economy. So we're looking at economic issues that are studied over here in topic three, um, then are all related to the economic objectives that we go through in topic four. So topic four is really binding and putting it all together. So topic four focuses more on balancing and achieving the optimal standards for each of these economic issues. So um, a tip that I've got here is that it's possible to use notes from topic three to address economic issues or economic objectives rather theory in topic four. So essay questions are commonly linked here, which is really um, important to note that you are providing and you are understanding those links when you're revising so that it becomes easier for you when you get to your HSC. Okay, to start off with how to approach HSC economics at this stage. So again, find your best study method. I know most of you would already have this, but at this stage of the course where you're now sort of revising, just be able to um, understand, okay, how am I going to revise that is most effective for me? Most of you would already have your notes um, done uh, and you would be you know, focusing on practice papers. So would highly recommend going through practice papers. That's something I did a lot at this stage. Um, and then also, you know, other people may be visual learners. So you may have visual cues or, or visual graphics as well. Um, completely up to you. In terms of understanding over memorizing. So make an effort to think deeply about the content that you learn, form your own judgments in class and engage in discussion. So it's very important to make sure that you understand rather than memorize because memorizing will only get you so far. Understanding will allow you to form your own judgment and forming your own judgment will allow you to better answer questions in the economics paper, which really value forming a judgment, having an opinion, talking about that opinion and being able to display that opinion. Um, those are important areas to consider. And reading beyond the textbook, really, that's quite important to be able to form your own judgments and opinions and to be able to articulate them effectively. After that, we've got contemporary economic issues. So this includes statistics, case studies, trends, etc. To collate the important stats in a form easy to memorize. So for example, graphics, documents, like having a, a separate document for all your stats. If you don't already, I would highly recommend um, doing that and becoming familiar with your syllabus and writing essay plans. So super important, right? At this stage, especially, um, you can obviously, and I would highly recommend that if you're not comfortable with writing essays yet, write full essays and timed conditions. But if you just want a quick practice and you don't want to spend 45 minutes to an hour writing an entire essay, you can just write little essay plans and get, you know, a little bit of um, practice in and revision in, in that way as well. So what would I include in my intro? What would I include in my body paragraphs? What events am I referring to? What stats am I referring to? And then your conclusion. Let's go into current economic news and HSE economics. So do I need to read the news? The answer obviously is yes. Um, obviously you would have already been doing this, but I guess to summarize in your longer response questions, you must include examples to back up your theory. So it's similar to how you would use um, quotes in English, right? So you want to be able to back it up rather than just simply mention it and then never look at it again. That's not going to get you the marks, right? So if you have, um, you know, examples, you want to back them up and say why they are relevant where you're talking about them. Um, so it's 10 minutes a week. I guess, you you know, it's something to do um, earlier. But if you haven't already, I would highly recommend spending a little bit of time to just go through it now um, and look at the different articles and see what's been going on and making news um, throughout the year. Um, how current do my stats need to be? So you don't need to know stats prior to 1990s, really. Like, you can know some of the events that have occurred, but not really. Like, it's not really that relevant. You should avoid giving current examples from pre-2018 unless you can't find anything, then it's fine. But if you can find something that is more current, like obviously, you know, try your best to find something from 2023, but if you can't, then 2019, 2020, 2021, 22, 22, 23 is fine. 
Um, HSC papers are written in around the middle of the year, so they won't expect all the stats to be super recent, but if you can try and make them as recent as you can, that would be beneficial um, and helpful, right? Stats that you must update include the cash rate, the economic growth rate, the US dollar over the Australian dollar, so the exchange rate, and a lot of this is coming from the RBA snapshot, which I'll show you in a second. Um, so we can definitely have a look at the RBA snapshot if you're feeling a little bit worried about how do I get all this information for, for all the different months. The RBA snapshot does a really good job at it, and it's like a really nice infographic, infographic for you to access. Um, so yeah, that's that and then how can I remember it all highly suggest that you tie it in with the theory right so make sure that you um, are able to understand the theory and then what it how it, how the stat relates to the theory and be able to then form your own judgment rather than just having random examples that you've just memorized because you've been told to have to know stats right make sure it makes sense to you color it differently to note so you might have your stats in blue or green or something um, to, to allow it to be different or you could have it just on a separate document as well. Um, summary tables and graphs are really good for really important key events such as the mining boom, GFC, COVID-19 and then the current recovery from that and what's happening right now in the economy as well. Um, so that's a really great place to to note down okay what's happened what actually happened to employment during that time what happened to economic growth at that time what happened to inflation during that time um, and it's really important because one of the essay questions will have stimuli and a lot of the stimuli will have the, the different years and it will show for example the trends in inflation from 1990 to 2023 or um trends in employment from 2000 to 2023 so then you've got like the peaks and troughs so you'll know what those mean for example if employment is really high during the mining boom and then oh well sorry if employment is really high in 2003 and then it falls really low in 2008 and then again goes back to normal and then falls again in 2020 you know what that means because you know the dates you know the events you know that it's really high in 2003 because the mining boom occurred then and you know that it fell employment would have fallen during the g uh, during 2008 because the gfc was then and then COVID again there was a fall right so those are different things to keep in mind and able to in, in being able to interpret that information. So do I need to read the use news? Yes, if you haven't already start collating as much as you can in terms of the most important bits of information and stats. Make sure your stats are as current as they can be. And um, how do you remember it all? Tie it in with theory, color differently to notes and summary tables and graphs. So what has COVID caused economically? So quite important to have a think about how COVID will impact your economic analysis. So going into 2020, Australia had worsening economic performance without considering COVID. So we were already not in such a great place. Um, and obviously COVID made it quite made it worse essentially so worse performance since the gfc with very weak spending and investment economic growth forecasts were repeatedly cut by the treasurer um so how did we actually you know compact the impact of it well we had a 320 billion dollar um lifeline that was thrown by the morrison government um that was the government in power at the time, and the stimulus actually represented about 16.4% of GDP, which is a significant chunk of GDP. It ended up supporting 6 million workers and around half of the Australian workforce. So talk about the analysis of that when you're going through it. So don't just mention, for example, if you had this stat, don't just mention the stat, talk about what it actually means and what it adds. Okay, so... Then we've got the um, economy that entered a recession. So Australia entered a recession uh, contributed largely by the fall in consumer spending, which was 0.6%, and the fall in investment by 0.8%. So which are both very, very important to make sure that we keep high. But obviously we had massive falls in them because there was a loss of confidence overall um, during that time period. So economist David from Beta Shares essentially stated that um, the economy was already struggling because of or before the pandemic and then and that was due to housing construction downturns, weak business investment and tapped out consumer spending and then 
you know, those fundamental challenges are still there and then COVID came along and it just made it a lot worse. So, again, very important to note that um, COVID has a huge role to play, but in saying that, it should only be about approximately 30, 20 to 30% of your um, economic news, right? The other should be other events should be of equal importance as well. So we're still talking about the mining boom. We're still talking about the GFC. We're still talking about all the other events in place, right? You're, it shouldn't just be, you know, COVID-19 throughout, right? You should have other things in your responses as well. But COVID is quite important, I guess, because it's more recent. So you want to have a bit to say on that as well. Right. So then we've got um, a five times faster recovery than we had in nineteen in the nineteen nineties recession. So Australia's health and economic outcomes compared favorably to international peers. So we were able to recover from COVID much faster than a lot of other economies, especially the other major advanced economies. We were able to actually outperform all of them in twenty twenty, and our labor market actually continues to recover quickly. So compared to major advanced economies, Australia is the first economy to have seen hours worked and employment recover to pre-pandemic levels, which is quite impressive. So again, something that you can definitely note down when you are talking about your um, COVID-19 side of things in your essay. So these are the key economic indicator snapshot that I was talking about. So they've just got a bunch of stats. So this is from three, the 3rd of August, but you can find the latest one if you just go into the RBA and write snapshot. So you've got the target cash rate, you've got the economic growth at that time, inflation at that time, unemployment and gro employment growth, wage growth, average weekly earnings, household savings ratio, um, net foreign liabilities as a percentage of GDP, um, the exchange rate against the US dollar and then China and the G7 GDP growth. So yeah, a lot of indicators there that are quite helpful, I guess, to include in your stats. So I would highly suggest that you find the ones that are most recent and then use those. Okay, moving on to the first topic, which is the global economy. So first thing we're going to look at is international economic integration. So we'll look at a few definitions here. So global economy simply refers to increased integration between economies of the world. So we've got a bunch of different economies and we want to make sure essentially that or will they have become increasingly more integrated and connected. Um, economic integration, what does this refer to? It's a liberalisation of trade between two or more countries, which allows for more free trade. Financial con um, contagion, essentially this idea that news of an economic disaster results in financial traders moving their money out of the affected area or nearby areas or economies, for example, in Europe. Essentially, what it's trying to say is if they feel like there's an economic disaster coming, they're going to get their money out of there in the case that, you know, that disaster and ends up taking their money or impacting their returns. We have then got gross world product, which refers to the total value of goods and services that are produced worldwide over a period of time. So for example, a year measured in the US dollar for consistency. So quite important to make sure that you understand gross world product, which is something the syllabus talks about as well. And then GDP as at um, PPP. So total value of gross world product in a given time period adjusted for variations in price and different exchange rates. So I guess, yeah, just to note quickly with the PPP, essentially what it's trying to say is they're trying to remove the effects of one-off little fluctuations or volatility because they know that that's not an accurate depiction of the price, so they're taking that out to have a more adjusted and appropriate and accurate GDP. Okay, so advanced economies, they make about 40% about of world GDP at PPP, so 14% of the population um, is coming from advanced economies. We've then got China and India, which are some of the largest emerging economies due to sustained rapid growth. Advanced economies do not have as much rapid growth as emerging economies. Emerging, econ emerging economies are growing the fastest. 
and then emerging and developing economies, they have a more significant chunk of the GDP, which is 60%, because there is also more countries, I guess, that are involved in that. And, and you can see that 86% of the population coming from emerging or developing economies. So a relatively small number of advanced economies dominate global production compared to larger uh, number of emerging and developing economies that have a lot, lot larger area of global production. So globalization, what does it refer to? Simply put, it's the integration and removal of barriers between countries and economies. So things like trade, free trade, um, you know, we have different technology, transport, all of that, financial flows all become more prevalent. So what are some forces that drive globalization? So first of all, we have new markets. So these are growing global markets, right? So this idea that in services such as finance, insurance, transport, deregulated financial markets and antitrust laws as well. So we have a lot of increased competition with that regard. So we have a lot of new markets because now we've become more integrated. There's a lot more available. We have a larger pool of resources as well. We've got new actors, so a lot of new actors that come into play because we're now more globalised. So multinational corporations, so these are very large businesses that dominate world production through global supply chains, etc. The World Trade Organization, which governs free trade and fair trade, which we'll talk more about So we progress. Uh, Non-government organisations, so these include foreign aid, regional trade blocks increasing such as the EU and policy cohort groups such as the G7 and the OECD. New rules and norms. So market-based economic policies are spreading now. Um, democracy is growing. There's a lot of human rights awareness as well. Action agendas for developing countries and a lot of multilateral agreements as well worldwide which is basically the things that we didn't see before globalization, um, we can now see because we've now got more integration and co uh, countries are more linked together than they ever were before. Uh, new tools of communication, so internet and electronic communications linking people simultaneously, so there's a widespread usage, for example, of personal devices, the internet, Digital media, transport, so there's increased trade, communication, and speed. In terms of trading goods and services, there's been an increase dramatically in the last few decades from 38% of global output in 1990 to about 50% of global output in 2018. So it's increasing quite a bit, and there's um, many reasons for that, but a lot of it has got to do with globalization and the indicators of that. So factors that have strongly promoted globalization include trade agreements between countries, which means that countries can freely trade without any protection barriers like tariffs or subsidies, quotas, etc. Domestic deregulation, so the removal of rules and laws that once made it very difficult to work through that. New technology in transport and communications as well. And then Australia having reduced tariffs to a record low of 2.3% in 2018. So the two main, uh, two of the main ways that Australia has promoted free trade is number one, by looking at bilateral agreements. So these are agreements between two countries. So Australia, for example, and the USA, or Australia and New Zealand, or Australia and China. Then we have multilateral agreements. So these are across regions such as Asia or the Pacific, etc. So the composition of global trade is continually changing due to demand of different or newer goods and services, the rise in incomes, so that consumers have more choice now, and new technologies. So the direction of trade flows has changed due to changes in the importance of regions. So trade flows have increased significantly for emerging economies as well. They're the ones that are growing the fastest, 17 to 19%, for example, between 1995 and 2015. So in terms of finance, it is one of the most globalized features of the world economy. This is because everything revolves around money, right? So they move instantly between countries, uh, for example, ATMs, credit cards, etc. And the main drivers of global financial flows include de financial deregulation, which began in the 1970s and the 1980s. 
right? So the removal of rules and laws that made it difficult to have, um, you know, a lot of the transactions were removed. Speculators, so investors who buy or sell financial assets with the aim of making profits from short-term price movements, this creates excessive volatility. So essentially, um, they're just sort of guessing. These investors are guessing where there's going to be a boom and where there's going to be a actual downturn in growth. And then they're just guessing and then investing their money. But if a lot of people do that, that can actually have very negative impacts. Uh, for example, when Brexit was announced that the that Britain was leaving the EU, uh, there was actually a lot of people, a lot of investors moving their money away from or financial assets away from the um, United Kingdom, which led to quite a bit, or, or Britain rather, um, which led to a lot of issues, I guess, with um, speculators, and they created a lot of volatility in that regard. Um, foreign exchange daily turnover is about four trillion in 2010 to about 6.6 .6 trillion in 2020. It's gone up quite a bit in 10 years causing a 40% increase in trading volume over the past decade. So then moving on, so we've got an important feature of financial flows is essentially the foreign exchange markets, which are networks of buyers and sellers exchanging currencies. So it's very important to be able to understand the network, right? So the main benefit is that it enables countries to obtain greater investment finance. The GFC actually led to a fall in activity in financial markets due to the increased risk aversion of lenders, higher cost of credit and increased volatility. So total activity on global capital markets fell by approximately a thousand billion dollars um, US to, from 2008 to 9 due to the GFC. So investment and TNCs, so investment essentially refers to international businesses, which are TNCs, operating in several countries in the hope of making a profit. So foreign direct investment, so FDIs, purchase a controlling interest in a foreign subsidy or subsidiary, sorry, of over 10%. So that's the key nature of a foreign direct investment is that it is over 10%. So that's something to note. If it is under 10%, it's a smaller interest. They don't really attempt to control that investors just looking for a, a like sort of return from that. And that's called a portfolio investment. So the global expansion of manufacturing, for example, takes advantage of the low labor costs and the cheap resources around the world. So easing capital controls and financial deregulation has caused FDIs in 2015 to increase to six times their level in 1995. So we can see that deregulation has actually allowed FDIs to increase because now there's fewer rules in terms of how money is transacted. So there are main, the main drivers of foreign direct investment include government policies that attempt to encourage foreign direct investment and migration laws that encourage international labour mobility as well. So international labour mobility is movement of labour across different countries and migration laws making that easier. Then we've got technology, transport and communication. So consumers are global. So e-commerce and travel plus shared tastes and increased choices are very important to consider. So firms are global, right? They are efficient. Uh, we're looking at efficient inventory management. We're looking at less waste. We're looking at increased competition and efficiency, reduced labor costs and improved communication. Essentially, a lot of this is allowed because of uh, or because of globalization, especially, especially things like reduced labor costs, where now you can outsource instead of having to pay, you know, or, or look at labor laws, things like that. In a lot of the advanced economies, that's why in Australia, a lot of things are outsourced out to other countries that don't have as many uh, regulations or laws surrounding employment and labor. Um, technology diffusion. So this is a way in which technology spreads from one country to another. So we've definitely seen an increase in that over the past decade of past decade. Um, transport. So transport infrastructure includes roads, railways, airports, and the, and the services that flow from it. So for, uh, et cetera. So for example, we're looking at the move, it's very important for the movement of resources as well. So communications, we're looking at growth in telecommunications has resulted in the rapid spread of information 
and communications technologies. So they have significantly increased efficiency as well. So really important to look at what role communications has played as well. So we can see that that definitely with telecommunications growing significantly, that that has a role to play in terms of where we are in globalization as well. So for example, we've got the introduction of 5G networks, which is set to increase global GDP as it facilitates faster mobile connectivity and continues to drive gains in productivity and efficiency. So we can see those different examples of technology um, and how they play a role as well. So technology, transport, communication are great indicators of globalization. So then we've got the International Division of Labour and Migration. So the International Division of Labour essentially is referring to tasks that are allocated to different people in different countries. So it includes multinational corporations. So this includes establishing manufacturing plants, um, how they've been able to outsource in emerging economies to utilise cheap unskilled labour as well, like we talked about earlier. And then geographical mobility, so the, ab the ability to move to different countries, things like that, and migration of all workers to developed economies. So in, in terms of immigration laws around the world, generally they restrict lower skilled workers from moving to other countries. Um, so that's something to note down there is that um, that can be a potential deterrent of... Um, achieving, I guess, maximum globalisation. Australia's major intake of migration is in the category of skilled migration. So 3% of the world's population have migrated to work in different countries, according to the World Bank. So definitely something to note there as a statistic that you can talk about in terms of the International Division of Labour. So human capital flows towards advanced economies due to um, their increased opportunity. So, you know, you know, people are likely to move towards advanced economies because they have a lot more opportunity, they have a lot more, um, you know, employment opportunities, things like that, and allow allowing of success in terms of the skilled nature of things. Um, increased technology gap between, or technological gap between developed and developing as well. Um, then we've got the international and regional business cycle. So this refers to changes in world output and economic activity as well. So this these are changes in the international business cycle that have varying effects on domestic business cycles. So depending on the level of a country's internationalization and integration as well, that is something important to have a look at. So, um, yeah, it's very important to look at how the international business cycle is changing because now we're more integrated than we ever were before. So it's almost like a domino effect. If one domino falls, the rest of them will also fall and that can cause quite a few issues. So in terms of the regional business cycle, it refers to the fluctuations in the level of economic activity in a geographical region of the global economy over time. So we're looking at, for example, the EU. Um, so this is a little bit different from international, this is just looking at one specific region. So for example, Europe or just Australia or just the Asia Pacific, whatever it is, rather than the entire economy as a global economy. Regional business cycles can be different to international business cycles because different things are going on in different countries. So research by the RBA shows that 63% of changes in output in Australia have been due to changes in interest rate growth levels and inflation from the G7, the group of seven, which are the top seven economies, essentially. So you can see what, like, the significance of the role that the G7 plays as well. Um, but again, overall, these are some things to note down that are quite important in terms of understanding what the international business cycle is, what the regional business cycle is, and then be able to talk about um, changes in output, things like that, in terms of the G7, the role that they play as well. So what are some factors that strengthen the international business cycle? We've got trade flows, which reduce trade barriers. We've got financial flows, which essentially allow for deregulation. Um, and we've got uh, like Forex as well, the foreign exchange market. And then we've got investment flows, so increased TNCs um, and foreign direct investments as well. Um, technology, so we've got as we talked about um, improvement in technology, we've got improvement in transport and communications than what we were in the past um, due to increased globalisation and global interest rates. So contagion has taken place in terms of that. 
with fact with factors that weaken the international business cycle we can definitely have a look at the domestic interest rates again contagion is a result of that government fiscal policies so taxes decrease spending exchange rates so fluctuations can be unfavorable and structural factors so influence compet competitiveness of the economy so definitely something to have a look at in terms of factors that strengthen versus factors that weaken so factors that strengthen again trade flows financial flows investment flows technology global rates interest rates of which we've talked about and then factors that weaken domestic interest rates government fiscal policies uh, exchange rates and structural factors so here's a practice question um, which of the following is most likely to be of benefit to a T and C so I'll give you the chance to attempt this give you um, a minute or two and then we'll reconvene and go through the answer Okay, let's go through the answer now. So the answer for this one is D. So migration laws that encourage international labor mobility. So this is going to be of benefit to transnational corporations because transnational corporations will find that when there is more labor mobility, they have a more of an ability to employ um, labor that is skilled or labor that they essentially need. Um, so because it allows a flow of movement there and they can utilize that. Um, to their advantage so that is the correct answer okay now we're going to move into the protection side of things so the first thing we're looking at is protection the definition of protection which is essentially the use of artificial barriers which restrict the free flow of goods and services in international trade to give domestic producers an artificial advantage 
So essentially they're trying to restrict free trade and why are they trying to do that? Essentially is to help out domestic producers who are struggling because of the competition that free trade brings because foreign producers bring a lot of international competition and domestic producers find it hard to compete. So as a result, they try, uh, governments try to give domestic producers an artificial advantage by issuing protection. There are a few different methods of protection that we will run through as well. So we'll start off first of all with reasons for protection. So there are a couple of specific reasons that the syllabus talks about that are quite important. So infant industry argument, so allowing newly established industries sufficient time to achieve economies of scale to compete in global markets and to become efficient. Right, so quite important to note that down is that when we have new industries, they're already struggling, they're already very small, you know, they're just trying to make their way. If international businesses come and compete, then there's no chance for the infant industry to grow in Australia. So the government will probably go, come in and help them out to help them become more efficient. So uh, temporary until that they are until they are internationally competitive. Otherwise, it may result in inefficient resource allocation. If they always rely on protection and they can't stand on their own two feet even after they grow, then that's a clear issue because it's inefficient for the government to continue to help them. Um, we don't want them to become reliant. We don't want them to, you know, not innovate things like that. We want them to. We're giving them sort of the starting steps, and then they can grow on their own. In terms of domestic employment, we're looking at if overseas countries offer cheaper production, then often domestic jobs are at risk. So imposing tariffs and barriers prevents job losses, things like that in terms of recessions. However, maybe at the expense of efficient export industries. So we might be taking away from efficient export industries and may raise exchange rates and affect expo export competitiveness as well as the terms of trade. So um, yeah, essentially we don't want domestic employment to be lower, but we also have to look at the efficiency argument. So these are the first two reasons for protection. We've got a few others, but infant industry argument is a good one that you can mention because this is often a question that comes up in the HSC as well as domestic employment. We then have dumping, which is when if a country has an oversupply of goods, so surplus of goods, they may decide to dump the excess products at a very low price, damaging local businesses as they are unable to compete. So the country may impose a quota to restrict the amount that can be imported. Right, For example, Oxfam has called for the EU to review its common agricultural policy, which heavily subsidises um, agricultural production and causes great excess production. Oxfam claim, claims that this is destroying livelihoods of farmers in developing countries. So essentially, if you have an oversupply and you're an overseas firm, you can just come to Australia, sell it for quite a low price. But then the domestic businesses that are actually trying to compete and actually trying to produce in an efficient way end up losing out. And those prices don't last forever as well. They're, they're low for a certain period of time, but then after that oversupply is finished, then it goes back to normal. So that can be detrimental for consumers because then they'll see a huge increase in prices afterwards. So that's something to note down as well. So it's not really helpful for those um, individuals and especially not for domestic producers. So that's another reason that the government may decide to step in and restrict the amount that is imported into the country to prevent dumping. Then finally we have defence, so the defence of a nation in the event of a war or defence of a culture. So some countries, just as a personal preference, even if they don't have a comparative advantage in producing a certain thing, just as personal preference they may decide to um, have that specific product just made in their own country because they like it that way, it's you know retainment of culture or um, as a form of natural na national security. So. You know, this can be, for example, countries having their own goods, such as weapons or own food in case of wartime blockades, things like that. So four reasons to make sure you remember for protection, in for industry argument, these are small industries that are just growing out. So we help them until they become efficient on their own. Domestic employment, we know domestic employment will likely fall because of international competition. Um, so that's a reason that the government can use for protection. We know dumping, oversupply, they don't want that because it's inefficient, it's damaging to local businesses, and defence of the nation as well. So here's a practice question. 
from t the 2017 paper. Question 21a says, why can dumping be used as a justification for trade prote protection? So this is two marker. I'll give you about four to five minutes to attempt this one. Just give you a little bit more time to, to plan it out, to write a response as to what you think would be um, included in this. Um, and then we'll reconvene and go, um, go on um, in terms of the lecture.
Okay, now let's go through the answer for this one. So, sample answer. Dumping involves foreign goods being sold in the domestic market below their cost of production. So, which could have definite negative impacts on competitive domestic firms. So, answers could include anything like potential higher prices as well in the future for consumers. Dumping might drive out efficient local producers and then potential for increased domestic unemployment as well. So foreign governments as well subsidizing producers. So they're all answers that you could have included but essentially just understanding that um, what dumping is, defining it and then the effect of it which is what the question is asking you to do. So why can dumping be used as a justification for trade protection? Then we move on to the methods of protection, the first one being tariffs. Tariffs are simply put taxes on imported goods imposed for the purpose of protection. So there are many advantages and disadvantages of tariffs, but essentially if a foreign producer comes into Australia and they want to sell goods, the uh, government may say as a form of protection for uh, domestic producers, they may say, um, you need to pay a tax on these goods that you are selling in Australia. So advantages include the redistribution effect so essentially this idea that it stimulates domestic production and employment and it may increase wealth as well the revenue effect that governments in government gains revenue and consumption and protection effect so this idea that imports may decrease and it will increase or improve the terms of trade the balance of payments and um, lower the current account deficit okay we then have disadvantages that include the price effect, so uh, may lead to imported inflation, so loss in consumers' real income due to higher prices, so definitely can lead to issues with regards to um, like the price effect because they can just pass it on to consumers. So if a uh, foreign producer were to come into Australia to sell a particular good, um, you know, they may just, um, and they get taxed, they'll just pass on that tax. Like, let's say they're selling it for $15 and then there's a $2, they're normally selling the goods for $15. Uh, the government imposes a $2 tariff, then they will just sell the goods for $17 instead. And so that pass is on to the consumer. So the consumer ends up paying the higher price. In terms of, um, the retaliation effect, um, this idea that, um, you know it will nullify protection because uh, if now the domestic producers go to sell overseas um, in effect they become the foreign producer right because they're now selling overseas then the overseas countries may say because you implemented tariffs we're going to do the same thing so that can be a major disadvantage so there are many advantages as well as disadvantages for tariffs Advantages include the redistribution effect, revenue effect, consumption and protection effect. Disadvantages include price effect and then the retaliation argument as well that, you know, they may decide to retaliate, um, which can cause a few issues there. We've then got quotas. So quotas are a quantitative restriction on certain categories of imported goods. So they're essentially trying to limit the amount of goods that can be bought into the country. So government saying, no, 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 you can't come in and sell as much as you want. You can only sell 50,000 of this good. So effects of quotas are like tariffs. So except that there is no government revenue that is generated. So with this, government revenue is generated because it's a tax. They're getting paid. Um, with this one, they're not getting paid. It's just a simple change in the quantity. So here's another practice question for you. A government decides to reduce the import quotas for a product. Remember that reduce the import quotas for a product means that they are reducing the amount that can be bought into the country, which means they're increasing protection. Other, other things being equal, which of the following is most likely to occur in the domestic market? Is it A, the revenue of foreign producers will increase? Is it B, the domestic price of the product will increase? Is it C, domestic firms will produce less of the product? Or D, the market share of foreign producers will increase? Again, I'll let you have a go at that one.
Okay, let's go through the answer for this one. So a government decides to reduce the import quotas for a product, other things being equal, which of the following is most likely to occur in the domestic market? So the answer is actually going to be B, the domestic price of the product will increase because now that there is increased protection, domestic producers get the favorable outcome compared to foreign producers, right? Foreign producers are now bringing in less of the good, so domestic businesses get the upper hand in terms of how they would like to price their products. Now moving on to subsidies. So subsidies are another method of protection. Um, subsidies look at providing financial assistance paid to domestic producers such as farmers to allow them to increase their supply and to compete internationally as well. So they essentially do a whole lot of... Um, they essentially provide a whole lot of support to domestic businesses rather than targeting foreign producers directly. They're just now sort of more providing assistance to the domestic businesses directly. So there are many advantages and disadvantages to this. And we can see the subsidy diagram here of the effect of a subsidy um, in terms of what happens to quantity and what happens to price as well. So in terms of advantages, we've got the... Um, Advantages of a subsidy over a tariff include encouraging domestic production, employment and exports. So, of course, this is going to help domestic businesses. They're going to be able to afford more things because now they're getting assistance. And so they're going to have a spike in employment. They're going to need more people to work for them, etc. And they're going to be able to sell more overseas as well. So that will end up improving our terms of trade. Um, price advantage as well for local consumers because there's less inflationary pressure uh, put upon consumers. Um, and then it's also easier to remove than a tariff, which can be quite difficult to do. And another advantage uh, where, you know, I guess, first of all, it's it's easier to remove than a tariff because um, the idea is that it's subject to regular reviews. Um, and then with tariffs, we know that we've got that retaliation effect that we talked about that, you know, countries can decide to do the same thing to us. So with subsidies, it's less likely that you'll have that retaliation effect. So there's less political costs associated with it as well. Then we have disadvantages. So this will essentially, this in essentially includes um, this distortion of resource allocation and the redistribution of income from taxpayers. So the taxpayers pay and then the government has a budget because that tax forms a part of their revenue. And it may increase the tax burden and be inefficient as well. Um, so in terms of direct costs on government budgets instead of income, that is something that's also considered as well. Um, so when they implement a tariff, they actually get money because they get yeah, they get the, the revenue off the tariff because it's a tax. Um, whereas now it's a direct cost on the government. The government's actually taking money out of their pockets and giving it to the domestic producers. So that's something of a disadvantage because now money is being spent there. And we know that it might not always be efficient that they're spending on these domestic industries because they may become reliant on these um, subsidies and then not be able to stand on their own feet. So advantages, again, encouraging domestic production, employment and exports, their price, um, uh, the price advantage for local consumers and the easier removal of a tariff uh, than a tariff compared to a tariff. And then um, disadvantages include the distortion resource distortion of resource allocation, sorry, and the direct costs of government on government budgets. We've then got local content rules and export incentives as our other two methods of production um, that is implemented by the government. Local content rules look at the idea of specifying a certain number of goods or a minimum percentage of locally produced parts in a product that you are selling or a proportion of goods in the market must that must be locally produced. So sometimes you'll see like a little sticker which says that 80% of the goods um, or 80% of Australian ingredient used ingredients used or something normally on food. So that's an example, right? So local content rules, they still want to encourage... Um, I guess, commerce in Australia, they still want to encourage or support domestic businesses. And that's a way to do that, to actually purchase a certain amount of goods from Australia. So another example is the one that I've got listed there. Um, an example of an Australian local content rule is that all 
is that all commercial free-to-air television licenses, um, broadcast uh, licensees, sorry, broadcast an annual uh, minimum transmission quota of 55% approximately um, Australia programming between 6 a.m. and midnight. So this protects Australia's dramatic and informative entertainment and culture. So essentially just still trying to encourage Australian businesses. Alright, so that's again local content rules, minimum percentage of locally produced parts or a proportion of goods in the market that must be locally made to help support those domestic businesses. Then we have export incentives. These look at giving domestic producers assistance, whether that be via a grant or a loan or advice to encourage businesses to penetrate global markets and expand their market share. So, for example, Austrade, which is the uh, Austrade's export market development grants, reimburse exporters for costs relating to the promotion of exports into new markets. So each dollar spent generates thirteen dollars and fifty cents for twenty-seven worth of exports, approximately. So again, another great example of an export incentive. So this idea that. This is another method of protection, right? This idea that you want to be able to provide domestic assistance, whether that be through a grant or a loan or just even advice to see how can these uh, businesses actually internationally compete and do well and gain market share. So again, we went through the methods of protection. We went through tariffs, which are a tax on imported goods imposed for the purpose of protection. We went through quotas, which is a quantitative restriction on the amount that can be imported into the country. We went through practice question and we went through subsidies, which is another example, which is financial assistance that's now targeting domestic producers directly. So helping them um, in order to compete internationally. Local content rules, specific um, or minimum percentage of locally produced parts or a proportion of goods in the market that must be locally produced, and export incentives, so giving domestic producers assistance. So effects of protectionist policies, including domestic, uh, including in terms of the domestic economy, we've got this idea of the distortion of resource allocation and income distribution. So local industries gain in the short term, but in the long term, there is a shift from efficient to less efficient industries, unfortunately. And that's the case, right? Because a lot of these local industries end up becoming very reliant on these uh, protectionist methods. So they can't really operate on their own two feet like we talked about. So it distorts um, resource allocation and income distribution. We then have inflation, which may increase as a result of the tariff on imported goods. So if inflation increases, then wages may increase as well. And um, that is an increase in the cost of production as well. So this idea that tariffs actually raise the prices because foreign producers won't just take the cost on the chin, they'll just pass it on. Um, so for example, when we went through that $15 of a product, $2 tariff, they'll just pass that on and then sell the good um, uh, with the additional $2 tariff. Um, economic growth may be slower. So as the resources are not efficiently produced, or not efficiently used, the output remains in the domestic market. So it's difficult to benefit from economies of scale, um, which can lead to slower economic growth potentially. And exports may be lower as well. So because the protected industries tend not to seek overseas markets, right? Because they feel like they've already got enough and they're just being protected and they're just sort of, you know, it's, it's essentially an area of inefficiency as well. And when there's lower exports, it reduces or worsens the, uh, the terms of trade. So we've got distortion and resource allocation, inflation, economic growth and exports. In terms of the global economy, what are the effects? They reduce access to markets because it's going against the concepts of globalization and free trade that we learned earlier, or trade liberalization. Um, so there's a developing, where there's this idea that the developing economies are often excluded who access from markets from advanced economies as well. Uh, international trade barriers, though so this the idea that it tends to harm developing economies who are actually exporting agricultural products and some of their manufactured goods. So there's a huge area of inequality in terms of the trade barriers. Um, reducing the trade economic and living standards due to shielding inefficient producers, people that aren't, or producers or businesses that aren't being 
you know, aren't really improving or they're just staying inefficient. They're just using the protectionist policies, but without that, they can't really do anything. Um, and then a decrease in global economic growth as well and capacity due to inefficiencies across the board. So there's a, a huge uh, misallocation of resources and this will lead to higher prices as well. Um, we talked about so reduction in access to a reduction in access to markets international trade barriers reducing reduction in trade economic growth and living standards and decreasing global economic growth and capacity so those are some of the effects of protectionist policies in the global economy again domestic economy a distortion in resource allocation and income distribution inflation economic growth may be slower and exports may be lower Okay, and that concludes the protection side of things. We'll now move on to the tips and tricks section in terms of approaching the HSE exam because I know that you're going to be sitting it in a couple of weeks. So um, here are a few tips and tricks on how to achieve success. Um, so first of all, in terms of the multiple choice, please be extremely careful when you're reading the question. So examiners often use tricky um, and like the challenging words or like they change the questions very slightly so that the meaning completely changes to what it would be. And students often miss it and they end up getting the question wrong. So um, this is especially, especially important because economics is one of those subjects where the multiple choice is quite difficult compared to the other HSIE subjects so it's something to note down there that they do try to make it difficult they do they do try to trick students a lot with the wording so words like long-term impact and short-term impact high and low hypothetical economy and specific economy what would happen and what is happening currently in the economy expenditure versus revenue so those little things but you know, those are little things but they make a huge difference in what the question is asking and what they're trying to say Please be mindful of the language that is used. Please re read the question, repeat it, take down any notes that will help you understand the question before. Read all of the different options before choosing the correct one. Use the process of elimination and please do ensure that if you find that two options seem like they're both correct, which is often the case with economics um, and the multiple choice, please make sure you choose the one that you feel like is the most correct. Um, because they will try to throw a lot of curveballs in there to try and um, trick you. In terms of common skills, questions um, student, students often get tripped up on involve consider uh, can be considered to be commonly tested economic skills. So really, you have the time to practice. So please do practice those questions now so that in the exam, you're not like, you know, um, I guess feeling overwhelmed or you don't know how to answer it. These are commonly tested. So you will see that a lot of these questions are seen in past papers. So you will kind of know where to go from. So calculating the current account deficit based on a table of values or ca calculating the multiplier value. So do you know the MPS? Do you know the MPC? Do you know what the multiplier is? Because they can even ask you that in a short answer question. Recognizing the size of a tariff and subsidy as well so those are really commonly assessed so please do make sure that you go back to past papers you look at them you attempt them and then you also attempt uh to mark them so go through the marking guidelines see where you went wrong and where you went right and then if you have questions it's a great time to you know either ask your teachers or your tutors whoever is available to help you out so again language please be extremely careful when you're reading the questions common skills making sure you know your common skills and they're commonly assessed so you can always check the past papers questions 17 to 20 are the back end of the multiple choice so the economics multiple choice exam is mostly ordered in terms of difficulty so this this can result in students becoming less confident as they approach the back end of the paper or the final questions so don't view these questions differently from others know that you have the knowledge to find an answer and take your time to think through a method to the solution it's um i know that it sometimes feel like you can't do it but what you need to know is that you've gone through the syllabus right and you have the chance now to go through the syllabus feel confident with all the questions attempt past papers so that you feel comfortable with the the back end of the paper which tends to be the harder questions not always but sometimes is the case uh, but don't psych yourself out. Feel comfortable with it so that you're not, you know, you're not mentally like, I'm actually really scared. If you feel comfortable enough with it, you'll feel like you're ready for any challenge. Um, and they can only assess you from what's in the syllabus. So again, just make sure that you know, 
you've told yourself, hey, I've actually covered everything. So it's not anything out of the blue. It's not something out of the ordinary. It may be a bit difficult to get around, but you have the time to go through it. So practicing more of these questions will definitely help build your confidence here, like I've mentioned. So don't view these questions differently from other questions. Know that you have the time or sorry, you have the knowledge to find the answer and take your time to think through the method for the solution. So if it's a calculation question, think back to when you've done practice calculations questions in class or on your own or with your tutor. Try and figure out, okay, what method do I use? How do I make it efficient? How do I make this um, happen in a way that is correct? And then we move on to the short answer section. So the short answer section looks at, you know, I think it is quite um, direct and to the point compared to um, the multiple choice. They don't, the short answer section doesn't really have any tricks that they're really trying to trick students or throw curveballs. They're quite direct questions that it's just assessing your ability to understand theory. Sometimes they include calculation questions in there. So just be prepared and the best way to be prepared is to go through those past papers, is to go through, for example, your trial exam and see which questions you went uh, you didn't really understand or you went wrong with and attempt those again. Ask questions with past papers, attempt them, but then also mark them. If you're not marking your past papers, you're really wasting time because you're not, you're doing them, but then you're not gaining anything because you don't know if you got them right or wrong or where you went wrong or where you went right, what you should do more of, what you should do less of. Also, marking them will help you get into the mind of the marker. Right. And when you're in the mind of the marker, you're able to, you know exactly what the marker wants, so you know what to write. So that's, a, a, again, a key skill to practice now as you're approaching your final exams or your HSC exams. So a general tip is it is at least one to two sentences per mark, but obviously don't count your sentences. That's just silly. But it also depends on the Nessa verb that's used. Um, a really great way to know how much you should be writing is to look at the amount of lines you've been given. They're a direct guideline as to how much you should be writing. So if it's a two marker, again, don't write 15 lines. And if it's a um, six marker, don't write three lines. Like, you know, obviously you have common sense, but also those guidelines are there to help you out in terms of how much you should be writing. Um, a general layout that you could remember for higher order short answer questions, perhaps those asking you to, for example, analyze, discuss, which is for and or against, for and against, and or even just explain, which is cause and effect, is to first define the key economic term in the question. So what is the term asking me to do? So if it's an ex explain question, what does explain mean? It, mean, it means to, um, you know, outlet or, you know, talk about the cause and the effect of a certain um, factor. Then take a moment to draw connections in your mind of what you know about that topic um, and then formulate an argument that will directly help you answer the question. Always highlight the key terms and then go from there. Then you want to consider the impacts on individuals and on businesses and the government, which are the three main stakeholders that are talked about in economics. So please do make sure that you understand that element and you include that, especially for the higher marked responses and where they're asking for that. Um, it doesn't have to be for every question, but it's just something to note on the side. And include diagrams and graphs in short answer responses to assist your explanations. This is not always the case, but this is often a, student, a question that students ask. Uh, I would suggest you don't always need to include it, especially for the lower mark questions. But if it's like a six, seven marker, what you can do is just have a graph if you feel like it's adding value. If it's not adding value and you feel like you're wasting your time, obviously you don't have to. Um, not every... Um, question will require a graph and some topics don't even have graphs so that's fine but in the case that you feel like you do want to um, include a graph you're more than welcome to if you feel like it will help aid your answer and add value to it. So again in terms of the short answer look at the guideline of how much you should be writing look at the amount of marks um, look at the guideline of the lines that you've been given have a general layout for the questions consider the impacts on individuals businesses and um government and then um if you would like if you feel like it's helping or adding value you can include diagrams and graphs in your short answer responses in terms of essay tips a couple of tips that i would always suggest is to plan right plan out your response what am i including in my intro what am i including in my body paragraphs what are the stats just quickly note them down on the side after you've uh, started your writing time 
um, complex sentences are not always rewarded. You don't all have to be very fancy. You can just be simple in terms of your explanation, but, you know, be succinct. But, you know, for example, don't have slang in your writing. That's obviously not going to help. In terms of, you know, making sure that you use clarity as well and that you use syllabus terminology to show the marker your extensive knowledge in economics, right? You want to be able to use economic terminology and economic concepts that you've learned throughout the year. Um, graphs, again, with essays, graphs are a great, great thing to include if they are adding value to your writing and make sure that you refer to the graphs. Don't just draw the graph and then never refer to it. Um, that's something that will throw the marker off or will make the marker go, well, you know, they just drew the graph for the sake of it. They didn't really, you know, have anything to add with the graph. Refer to the graph, you know, you can even like label it figure one, just like your textbook does, and then talk about it like that. Uh, succinct, but no slang, you know, it is still an essay uh, format. So just try to be, uh, you know, not too informal to the point where there's slang. Theory versus fact. So something in economics that we like to... I guess remind you is that you know the theory aspect is sometimes very different from what happens in real life so theoretically this could happen mentioning that for example can help but also don't take away don't write that for everything don't write may or might because sometimes it can come off as not confident so find that balance strike that balance of could theoretically that you know the difference between or you're trying to show the marker that you know the difference between what's theory and what's going to happen in real life can sometimes be very different um, but whilst also depicting that you are very confident in what you're saying. Um, counter arguments so this can be really beneficial for where you have to form judgments and you can have like for example 70% argue for 30% argue against um, where you have like a however statement to show the other side especially with like for example talking about policies you have like limitations and benefits of policies so you can split that. Make sure you know your Vanessa verb definitions. Um, if you don't know them, they are uh, they can be accessed via the Nessa website. So if you just write Nessa verb glossary, all of the verbs should come up and that should be really helpful in terms of understanding because each verb has a very different connotation to it in terms of how you should be writing and the structure in which you write in. So just make sure that you know what verb it is and how to, to attempt that. So I would start practicing using different verbs and seeing how you go and then seeking feedback either from your teachers or your tutors. Um, and then you've got stats. So, um, you might, must not just state the stats because that's not adding any value. Again, that's, you know, simply just, um, at that point, you're just like, again, doing it for the sake of it. You're not adding any value. If you're just saying the GFC reduced employment by X percent in due to lower consumer spending. Okay. But why? What happened? You know, give us an explanation as to what's happening. Treat it like a quote in English where you follow a peel, peel method. You're actually explaining the evidence. Same concept applies with stats in economics. And then wide reading quotes you can include as well. So again, a quick rundown of the essay tips that I've got. Plan, make sure that you, you know, understand that you don't have to be overly fancy or complex. Um, clarity and use syllabus terminology, make sure you've got graphs in your writing um, if you feel like it's adding value and refer to the graphs in your essay, succinct but no slang, make sure that you've got that idea of could theoretically you understand that gap but don't be, um, you know, don't come off as not confident in your arguments, have counter arguments if they're adding, especially with judgment questions, have, have a, however statements again following on from the previous point, Know your Nessa verb definitions, access them via the Nessa verb website, Nessa verb glossary. Um, stats, make sure that you are treating them like a quote in English. You are analysing them, you are not just simply stating them and then, not, and then never referring to them again. And wide reading quotes as well. How to pick the right essay question. So read the essays first um, in real reading time and then read the rest of the paper. Then when you read over the rest of the paper, you can go back to your essays. For some people, they feel more confident in certain areas and they start by thinking, you can start by thinking, okay, which one do I feel the most confident with? How do you know which one you feel the most confident with? Which one do you feel like you have a lot to say for? Like you have a lot to brainstorm. 
Which one do you feel like you know more stats for, more events for, more ideas for? Maybe you've gone through a certain topic and you really feel confident with it, you're really passionate about it and you find it really interesting. That could be another reason. Which lends itself more towards our contemporary economic climate, right? So uh, with, with one of the questions, you'll be given stimuli to work with. So look at the stimuli. Which stimuli can you assess better which, and analyse better? Which one do you think could be easier for you? Which one, in terms of band six, which one relies on less strict theory and more analysis? Right, that's something to note as well. So tips to integrate stimuli. So first of all, highlight the keywords from the syllabus, right? So you've got the keywords, for example, can be monetary policy, fiscal policy, whatever it is. Highlight any information that directly references a specific economic event or organization or a forum, right? Those are really important because they can allow you insights into what's going on. Is the stimulus dated? This could hint about which contemporary economic stats you'll need to include in your response. Treat the stimulus like quotes in English. Use them to back up your theory, to answer the question more directly, and to mention content more relevant to what the marker is looking for. Right? Make sure that you're specific in that regard, because again, that will help you out tremendously. Where is the stimulus coming from? Does it have a little reference? Is it coming from the World Bank? Is it coming from the Australian Bureau of Statistics? Where is it coming from? Try to figure that out. Try to use that information to help guide you in terms of what you should be writing. And also, you know the major events. You know the mining boom. You know the GFC. You know COVID. You know post-COVID recovery. You know all of these. So you can definitely use this to see, okay, if there's a dip in economic growth during COVID, I know that it's because of... Uh, during 2020, I know it's because of COVID. Or if there's a rise in economic growth during 2003, I know it's because of the mining boom. Having little things like that to help you prep now can really help you out when you get to the final exam and you're trying to integrate your stimulus. You're essentially integrating it just like you would integrate your stats. You're analysing it and you're referring to it. A really big mistake that students tend to make is that they don't integrate that stimuli. They don't refer to it enough or they don't refer to it at all. Please don't do that. Right. They really want you to refer to it. That's why they're wasting ink on every single paper, printing out those extra graphs, those extra quotes, those extra little tables, because they want you to refer to them and talk about what they add. So here's an example essay question. Assess the effectiveness of monetary policy to manage price stability and economic growth in Australia. So you've got the theory aspect, which monetary policy, inflation, economic growth, Right, those are the key terms of the question. Price stability refers to inflation, economic growth, economic growth, monetary policy, monetary policy. Now it's saying the directive is assess the effectiveness of. So what is assess the effectiveness? You need to order your paragraphs and theory according to importance. What do you think the importance is? That's up to you to decide how effective something is. So you need to make a judgment. Students that don't make a judgment will only, will not be able to get the, the maximum marks, right? You need to be able to make a judgment on the limitations and the benefits of monetary policy use. All right, so give reasons why and examples from Australian economic events. So that's where your stats come in. Right. Once you've ordered your paragraphs, you've made a judgment, make sure you also draw out the relationships between monetary policy and theory, whilst including real life examples. So that is one example question. I'm now going to hand over um, to you and ask you to have a go at this one in sort of creating a similar plan for how you would approach this essay question. So this one says, analyze the success of fiscal policy and recent Australian budget in managing full employment and the distribution of income in the Australian economy. So I'll give you a few minutes to just come up with some sort of a plan for this one, and then we'll go from there.
Alrighty, let's go through a plan or overview of how you do this one. So in terms of a plan, looking at budget outcomes and stances, so theory from fiscal policy um, is quite an important one that you can mention there. So what are the different types of outcomes, what are different types of stances that can be talked about? Um, you can then also have a look at the budget overview from the different years. So the most recent budget overview would be good to include in this as well, as well as employment and income trends to allow you to answer to the full employment um, area. Um, and then income trends as well, like in terms of answering to the distribution of income area. Um, trends are really important and they are really good to include because it will show the marker your extensive knowledge and understanding of the different economic theories, but also that how do we apply that to real life? What have we seen occur? In terms of unemployment, um, we can look at the underutilization of labor as well and budget specifics. So that will allow you to answer more towards the managing of full employment. And then with term with in relation to distribution of income, we're looking more at the budgetary effects and the Lorenz curve, etc. So you can even draw out the Lorenz curve. And then with unemployment, you can even draw out um, the Phillips curve a little bit um, if you if you feel like you can link it as well. Um, and then you have an overall analysis of the success of the budget as well. So, um, yeah, essentially that's a little bit of a plan um, of what you can talk about in terms of assessing the success. Again, assess the success. You do want to have a similar concept of uh, the directive that we've talked about here. So hopefully you've got that down. Um, in terms of quotes, you can use uh, various different uh, media articles, media websites as wide reading. So for example, you can um, sort of list them and then once you've mentioned them, you can tick them off as you go in terms of the essay so you don't forget any. So that's why I would suggest that when writing time starts, you quickly jot down a few things for each essay question because at the start of the exam, you arguably have a lot more information that's retained and as the exam progresses you're focusing on other things you get distracted you may forget certain things that you remembered at the start when you first read the essay question so when writing time starts just have a got writing all of those down so that you have that in on paper so then you can tick it off um as time passes and you're writing your essay um even if you decide to come back to your essay at the end that's fine as well just write a few things at the start so you don't forget or you don't get distracted okay and essentially that brings us to the end of today's lecture so thank you so much for listening in today i hope that you found this lecture somewhat insightful and you took something away from today's lecture that you'll integrate into your revision and your studies um yeah so um that's all from me so thank you so much for listening in and yeah